Part one of this conversation was all about the basics of astrophysics. Part two is where we talk about aliens and deeper concepts that you have asked about on Twitter. This part is centered around most of your questions. And of course, no episode of the Renvi show is complete without spiritual talk. What's the astrophysics behind spirituality? That and more on this part two of a very special conversation with Abhijit Javda. Ask you about aliens, sir. <laughs> I'm sure you've thought of this, but before before I highlight aliens, I mean, we're not going to talk much about abductions. Is that something that fascinates alien abduction? Not really, not alien okay. abduction, but aliens. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, again, another podcast topic, but <laughs> you know, getting into just the introduction to that topic. So I had COVID about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I couldn't work at all. I couldn't write. I couldn't create. So I just figured that yo, let me watch as many great movies as I can, and I watched a. gorgeous movie that stayed with me it's a little heavy i recommend you watch it i think you'll really appreciate it i believe it's called arrival have you seen this i have uh it's about uh, the communication between humans the linguistics and linguistics yes. it's arrival right arrival it's arrival yes movie. um it's a heavy movie it's, it is it, a very heavy movie yes it's it's meant not for masala cinema goes it's meant for people who think uh the basic gist without without revealing plot details is that okay aliens have arrived on earth they are possibly friendly possibly not and human beings don't know how to interact with aliens same aliens don't know exactly how to interact with human beings because there's a language barrier imagine 2000 3000 years ago someone in india goes to japan how are they going to interact they'll say oh me me then a japanese person will say the word for me me uh they'll say the word for yes japanese person will say the word for yes um so they've shown this whole interaction between humans and aliens eventually they sort of learn how to communicate with each other they give each other names all that and the final kind of plot explosion in the movie is that humans realize the secrets of the aliens language and how our language is sort of linear like when i'm saying okay so my name is ranveer alawadia you are abhijit it's linear it's linear yes <clears throat> but aliens don't in that movie don't talk in a linear language they talk in a circular language yes yes uh where you can read a sentence probably backward and forward and there is a concept sort of concept of time travel in that um in a hidden in their language and the reason aliens come down to the earth is to uh show humans their own advancements in science in language in all these things uh so that's what i gained from that movie uh once i'd like to highlight what you gained again as a physicist you're watching that movie and i'm sure it must have kind of uh, turned some light bulb on in your head also but obviously we'll also talk generally about aliens so it's a very interesting thought experiment these movies and uh, science fiction books are essentially thought experiments what if you had this sort of a situation or this sort of a dialogue between an alien and a human so how would we go ahead and proceed and try to communicate and what if tra- time travel were possible so what what exactly is time right is it linear is it circular is it something else hmm. so these are the concepts that you explore in these stories this is a new concept that was there hmm. which i have not come across before the linguistics of uh, communication between aliens and humans that's never been explored before as far as i understand but yes aliens could be very different from us we are carbon based creatures right our bodies are carbon based the chemistry is carbon based you could have aliens who are silicon based or <laughs> who are based on something else entirely mm. right for example on on the uh, on saturn's moon titan the temperature is, is uh, minus 200 something degrees but it has liquid flowing over there which is hydrocarbons okay so there could be a whole different kind of biology over there which is completely alien to what we have and what if that kind of situation somewhere else in some other solar system would produce an intelligent species mm. now how would we communicate with that right so that is one of the interesting questions that arises out of a out of a story like this mm. but the bigger question is do aliens exist right if they are there where are they where are the, all the aliens how come we have seen no signs of aliens right because we have been searching we have been searching we have these radio telescopes and all that which search for signals and pulses and so far we haven't found anything concrete you know like unmistakable sign of some civilization or intelligence so that is the big question the fermi paradox where are all the aliens right and there are a number of uh, i don't know possibilities 
first of all, it's possible that our instruments are too rudimentary and primitive. It's like you have a Morse code machine and you're trying to beep, 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 send it. <laughs> and these guys have extremely advanced technology, mm. right? So maybe we are too, we are too backward. Mm. We think we are very evolved, but compared in the, in the galactic scheme of, scheme of things, we are like ants, for mm. example. I mean, if you were to explain to an ant why you have a, why you have a mall and why you have uh, all these things, the ant won't understand at all, right? You just can't get it through into that, uh, that creature's brain. Mm. Similarly, there could be an enormous disparity in intelligence and uh, technology. The other thing is that uh, alien technology, if it is an advanced civilization, it would not leak out uh, energy. So if you look at the earth at night, you see it glow because the entire planet is covered with lights, right? Now there is a huge wasted, wastage of energy because the light mm. should be directed downwards, not upwards. Mm. So we are wasting, we are extremely energy inefficient. An advanced civilization would not be energy inefficient. It would not beam out random, random noise into the universe. Mm. Right. The communications would be very, very uh, energy secure. So there are lots of uh, concepts that we have to think about and lots of possibilities why we haven't actually come across alien civilizations. And maybe it's a good thing. Maybe they are dangerous. Maybe they don't want us to evolve and become uh, advanced to their level. Mm. So that is one of the big issues and, and the fields of, of, of research, you know. Because you've studied the solar system this much, do you believe that there's a possibility that aliens could be a part of our solar system also and we've not explored? See, if you look at the history of the Earth, the Earth is approximately 4 billion years old. Now, we know that life on Earth emerged around 3.8 billion years ago, as soon as the planet cooled a little bit. So life just seems to have spontaneously evolved, or arisen on Earth because of the, the chemistry, the geochemistry of the, of the planet. And we know that Mars had a similar kind of environment about a billion, billion and a half, two billion years ago. Similar to Earth. It was a very wet planet. It was warm. So why is it not possible that there could have been microbial life on Mars? Hmm. And there are other planets, other moons, for example, moons of Saturn and Jupiter, where we know there is a where there are large bodies of water. Hmm. For example, I think it's Europa that has a yeah, subsurface yeah. ocean. Yes. There's Ganymede that has a bigger surf, subsurface ocean than Earth. And if the ocean, if the water is liquid, it means it is warm, and it means there could be biochemistry over there, and it could also create life. So, in my opinion, I think it's highly probable that there is at least microbial life in our own solar system outside the Earth. Mm. But as far as intelligent life goes, I don't think there's any intelligence, at least what we recognize as intelligence, mm. in our solar system. Mm. But there are billions and billions in the Milky Way itself. There are about a hundred billion stars. And in the observable universe, there are about 1 trillion galaxies. So you can imagine how many stars there are, right? 10 raised to 21, 22. <laughs> so it's statistically absurd to think there is no life out there or even that there's no intelligent life out there. Mm. I am convinced that there is intelligent life out there. It's just that the universe is too vast and too empty for us to have found it thus far. Mm. And maybe we don't know how to look for it. Maybe mm. we're not advanced enough to look for it. Ah, mm. uh, wow. <laughs> Firstly, wow. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, I'm going to highlight, we spoke about arrival. I'm sure you've had some science fiction inspirations in your own head. Uh, for me, growing up, I grew up in the age of video games. And uh, I always chose video games that expanded something in my mind. Uh, if I was a fa in a phase where I wanted to learn about football, I played FIFA. If I wanted to learn about basketball, I played NBA games. If I was in a phase where I wanted to learn about life, I started playing a video game called Sims, which is- Sims, I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, where you control a human being's life. You're playing God. You say, okay, go take a shit, go eat, go sleep. It's a simulation, isn't it? Yeah, simulation of life. Yes. Sims was a rage in the 2000s. And towards the late 2000s, some motherfucker, I think from the same Sims company, the company that made Sims, which one was it? I can't remember. But I believe it was the same company. It was someone who had worked on Sims, said that, let me take this concept of playing God into the life of a whole species. Mm -hmm. So human beings evolved from apes, apes evolved from some smaller animal, the smaller animal evolved from some cell. So in this game, it's called Spore. Okay. It was a rage when it had come out. At least there was a lot of hype about it. The execution and the way they made the game wasn't that fun. Okay. So the game didn't catch on, but it opened up a lot of kids' minds. Mm -hmm. So Spore begins as, uh, you start as a one-cell creature. Unicellular organism, yeah, yes. And you go through the process of evolution. Evolution. So you <clears throat> are in the ocean. You're a yes. one-cell in yeah. the ocean. And then you have to engulf other cells. Then you become a fish. 
then you have to engulf smaller fish and not be engulfed by bigger fish. Yes, yes. Then you become a creature where you are an animal and you have to hunt on yes, land. Yes, yes. Then you become a tribe where there are tribes of different creatures. Mm-hmm. And then you have to become the dominant tribe, like which is what happened with sapiens versus Neanderthals yes. and uh, what's the other one? Das uh, Denisovans. Den- Denisovans. Yes. Uh, so you become a tribe then you become that that dominant tribe which is what the human species is today it's the, it's our story isn't it yeah yes then uh, once you're the human species you have to play a city level where you have to fight wars with other countries <laughs> which is what we're at right now which is what we probably just come out of but then eventually the whole world becomes one country where you're fighting against your species but then you unify the whole species and the next stage is intergalactic travel and that's wow. the stage that actually opens up your head as a gamer You're like yo what <laughs> and then if you compare to the human story we've just reached right outside of pluto right now yeah, we don't sure. even know what's out there yes uh and in spore again when you are in intergalactic being there's lots of friendly ones there's neutral ones and there's aggressive ones uh and the eventual aim of the game is to reach the center of the galaxy uh which is which is like a power point it's a source of power it's a source of i believe food and all there's some planets there which are like a source of food or some something like a source of minerals so it's a battle for resources of the galaxy something like that i see yes um again this is all just hypothesis these are all just theories this game i spent hours on it just to reach the center of the galaxy to maximize on each level all that was beautiful beautiful exercise for the mind the game flopped there was never a sequel really yeah yeah oh. uh, because they didn't execute well i mean there is i, see, I, see. I mean they they failed as a product but they didn't fail as an idea the idea seems to be very great yeah <laughs> um what do you think is at the center of the milky way galaxy a supermassive black hole okay we know it's there okay yeah it's been observed God. its gravitational effects have been observed because you can see stars slinging around very fast mm. around this black hole before i ask you questions about black holes i've got to ask you questions about your science fiction inspirations so i would say for me it's spore what i just spoke about arrival which we also spoke about in this podcast arrival blasted my head so it's a very simple movie lots of people won't like the movie the third one i definitely say is interstellar that's a great movie oh. yeah and i know that nolan consulted with physicists yeah, to he did. Yeah. create yeah thorn yeah to create visualizations to create the exact graphics yes even you know the climax of interstellar and spoiler alert uh, i think we've already spoken about in the podcast where he basically matthew mcon he passes through a black hole and he enters another dimension yes so our dimension mm. is um x axis y axis which means if i walk in a straight line it's x axis if i walk sideways it's y axis if i jump up it's z axis that's it with 3d creatures he enters a dimension where there are uh, more than just three axes and that fourth one he can't even explain so his mind isn't able to perceive what's going on but it's basically time time travel is that considered the fourth axis yeah time is supposed to be the fourth uh, dimension of space time in general relativity so Got time it. is the fourth dimension Got it. so when we say space it is these three axes x y z forward sideways jumping up yes or going down yes and then the fourth one is time it's time which means that which year were you born in uh 1976 i can go back to 1976 right now because 1976 is happening at the same time as 2021 <laughs> but our minds are only able to perceive 2021 as of now possibly because of the quantum physics theory that you stated that when you put your attention on something it becomes a real thing it's a possibility <laughs> <laughs> i would actually love the physics expert to shed some light on these axes time travel and all these concepts so in general relativity a uh, space time is a four dimensional uh, arena that the entire universe is embedded in okay so it's like a platform that you play in but it has four dimensions now <clears throat> time travel i am not sure if it is possible because it may break the causal structure of the universe one of the possibilities of how to do time travel is the concept of the wormhole in which you go Uh, backward you you loop through something and you go back to another uh, not just a different place in the universe but a different time in the universe mm. so that may break some causality laws of the universe so we are not sure how that works okay stephen hawking had uh, proposed that it it may not be allowed because it breaks causality but that is just a conjecture we don't have proof of that so wormholes would be the best way to travel back or forward in time is it possible it may be possible we don't know yet but uh, talking about dimensions in uh, string theory for example 
string theory doesn't work in three dimensions or four dimensions. To have a proper theory in which it works, you need ten dimensions. What is string theory? Can you explain it? Like, so um, string theory is a, it's a, it came out of the uh, need to reconcile gravity with quantum theory. For example, quantum field theory, which I spoke about, it is all about fields. This theory doesn't work in curved space time. In general relativity, matter curves space time, right? And if you try to use uh, quantum field theory in that, it breaks down. So, so the mathematics breaks down. One, it, one, one second. So I gotta, I gotta break it down way further for the listeners. So when you said matter curves space time. Okay. Yes. Uh, that basically means that. So they say that imagine space time like a long bed sheet. Like a long bed sheet, like a trampoline, like a long surface. That's the a stretchable uh, surface. Okay, that's the arena you spoke about. Yes. And you're saying Manlo, our universe is like a ball. Let's say the sun is a ball. Okay, the sun is a ball. So you put the sun on this arena, it will go down deep into that. It will stretch okay. and it will warp the entire surface. Mm. So if you have a smaller ball, which was earlier passing in a straight line, because of the presence of the sun, it will start, it will move in a curved line. Got it. And that's why you have these orbits around the sun. The planets go in orbits around the sun. So... According to general relativity, matter warps space-time and it tells other matter how to move. Got it. Okay, so that is the, that is the concept of warping of, sp of space-time. And that's where the concept of gravity also comes into play. That it gravity doesn't... is nothing but the warping, the curvature of space-time. It is just a geometrical, uh, it's an outcome of geometry. It emerges out of the geometry of space-time. Let me take this a little deeper. Now, we think that the universe that we see around us, these stars, that blackness of space is all that there is. But there's actually something we possibly don't see, which is that uh, space-time bed sheet that we spoke about. What yes. is the official word for it? Space-time. Space-time. That's it. It's Manlo, it's like, I mean, just try assuming that it's like a, uh, it's like a bed sheet. Yeah. We are not able to see that. The bigger the object, the more it has an impact on space-time. Yes. And <clears> therefore, uh, if we're talking about the sun, which has, which is so heavy, it has a huge impact on space -time. It does, yes. And it affects the smaller objects around it. Which human minds understand as gravity that, oh, here's a big object and that's why we're attracted to it or we orbit around it. But it possibly also has an impact on the human mind's perception of time. Am I right? Yes. So time, space time consists of time as well, right? So, uh, so what happens in general relativity is that around a large object, time itself gets warped. Time itself slows down. So for example, sitting here on the surface of our planet, Time moves at a certain speed. Mm. If you go 100 meters, 100 kilometers up into orbit, time is slightly faster. Just it's the the difference is very very little. Mm. But if you had a clock that was accurate enough, you would be able to measure the difference mm. at, at the speed at which time travels. Right. Now, if you were to orbit around the sun close by, then time will move at a different speed. If you were to take an orbit around the around a big black hole. Then for you, it may it may feel like it's been just 20 minutes, but on Earth, it will be 20 years. Mm. So that's the kind of uh, effect that, uh, that you see in general relativity. And this has been actually measured. Which is what they show in Interstellar. where In Interstellar, they show that, yes. Yeah, where he spends, I think, one hour or something of a short duration on a particular planet. Then he comes back to his spaceship and he gets a message from his own daughter who is now as old as him. <laughs> He's like, whatever, 35? And now his daughter is also 35. That's right. That's She's right. spending time on Earth with uh, the time phenomenon that we know on this planet. And he has gone on this other massive planet where time for him has slowed down a lot. I think that planet was in orbit around a large black hole. And that's why time was slower. Oh, okay. Got it. So what is your theory about what will happen? I don't know it's a very... Uh, guesswork based question what's your theory about what will happen if we pass through a black hole well according to the according to physics that we know there is something called a tidal force a tidal force is when you have a long object and the force of gravity of, uh, affects that object so it affects the foot differently and the head differently so the if you are falling into an object the bottom part of your of your, let's say your feet, they will perceive gravity st uh, more strongly than your, head than your head perceives. Now, when you have an object as massive and compact as a black hole, the difference in this force of gravity is very, very significant. Your hands and uh, your, your legs and in your head. So what happens is that it stretches you apart. This process is called spaghettification. 
So if you are falling towards a black hole, especially if you pass the event horizon, you're going to be stretched into a kilometers long st uh, strip and you won't be alive anymore. Mm. So that's what happens. That is the physics of general relativity and that is definitely going to happen. Now, this may not happen if it is a very large black hole, in which case the spaghettification will not be so apparent. But what is inside, we have no idea. Like there are theories of what may be inside a black hole if you pass the event horizon. According to general relativity, there's something called a singularity inside, which is where the density of matter and the curvature of space-time space become infinite. So that is the one point inside a black hole where you have this phenomenon. But that actually is not going to be true because singularities usually are indicative of a problem in your physics. It is not a real thing. It, it, it's just a mathematical equ equation blowing up. It's like dividing something by zero. That's what? when you get a zero, that's when you get infinity, right? Mm. So what it indicates is that our theory isn't perfect. It needs to be refined so that we can actually understand what happened. What I'm visualizing is, okay, now coming back to that theory about there is the universe, the universe and all its objects are sitting on a bedsheet called the space time. Space time. On, on space time. If there is an object as heavy as a black hole, that means it won't tear through the sheet of space-time or it might. But suppose that space-time sheet is not terrible. Then the black hole keeps sinking into something else. Infinitely. Infinitely. Yes. But coming out on the other side into another dimension? Well, there is a theory that on the other side of a black hole, there's something called a white hole, which is a portal into another universe where time flows backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the theories that also is a solution of uh, Einstein's field equations so that is a possibility so if you maybe go into a black hole you may emerge on the other end mm. into a very strange universe where time flows backwards mm. wow <laughs> I'm just going to move on to the rapid fire now <laughs> no no but this is this is just such a heavy and beautiful podcast like I've learned so much on this so. Uh, what else do you know about? Because you're a history expert, you're a physicist. What else? What, 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 what are the other knowledge portals in your head? Well, I've been reading all my life. Uh, I have always been interested in science, physics, chemistry, biology, all of that. I have also been a very big fan of history. So I've been studying history since the time I was seven or eight years old. There was this series of books by an American author called Will Durant. It was called The History of Civilization, I believe. It was enormous thick black books but I used to devour them like like they're fiction you know because history is the most interesting mm. story that you can find out there yeah. so I read about the Egyptians and the Romans and all of these civilizations and eventually I came into India at a, at a later age mm. so I know I mean I've been reading about history my whole life I I could be considered to be a historian I don't have a degree in history but I do have an understanding of history. You know, what are even degrees, man? No, nah, like, degrees are just pieces of paper. Yeah, it's all about, it's all about your urge to learn. I, I strongly feel that. Like, I remember when I was starting out as a fitness coach, people asked me, oh, where's your degree where's from? Where's your degree? But, uh, you know, it's it's about how, again, every everything boils down to wisdom and consumer experiences. When yes. you combine the two, you get business. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, we will do the rapid fire round. I uh, just want to address one thing. A lot of people will be listening to this podcast, watching it, thinking that why didn't we go deeper into topics? It's because I have 20 podcasts right here. This is just to introduce you to my big brother now. And uh, I guess even in the rapid fire round, you'll get to see new nuggets off his head. We will be doing a Hindi episode about history, an English episode about history after this, and so many more episodes going forward. But let's move on to the Twitter verse rapid fire round now, sir. Okay, so, so these are Twitterverse questions. You don't need to go too much into detail, but feel free. Again, it's an open conversation. Mr. Bhavesh Joshi asks, is the sound of the cosmos really Om or Aum? Well, I am not sure about that because we don't even know if this, uh, if, if acoustic vibrations happen in the cosmos. Mm. See, the sound that we perceive on Earth is because of the vibrations of the air molecules around us. Mm. The vibrations that are there out there in space are of a different kind. Like I said, it's all fields. Mm. So so the photon field vibrates at a certain frequency. And it'll have a certain sound. Well, I mean, if, you, if you translate that into human audible sound, it may sound like something. We don't really know what it is. So uh, we perceive the photon vibrations as light, right? And there are other vibrations as well. Every field has a certain frequency of vibration. So I don't know what it sounds like. It's it's never been tried to <laughs> to translate that into human audible sound, but that's what our spirituality, our our scriptures say. Mm. I think I think uh, again from spiritual uh, books that I've read, they say that um, 
every every sound in the world can be derived from a base of three sounds like the rgb theory yes yes like in terms of you have three base colors and then you can derive more colors out of that so when you combine a o m mm, these are three base sounds okay which your voice box is capable of generating uh-huh. also yes and then depending on the movement of your tongue and your lips uh, you can change it so if i want to say ranveer i basically use a o m mm, With a combination of my tongue and my lips. Yes, correct. To generate that. So if I want to say R, I'm basically saying A, ah, but I'm also vibrating my tongue in a certain way to bring out the R. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and this is just the human body, but again, mm-hmm. the body is a representation of the universe. And uh, they say that the sounds out there are ah, O, oh, M, mm, but then um, those those basic three sounds can be changed into other kinds of sounds other kinds of sounds i right. think that's where the questions uh, logic also comes from mm. um same guy i think he's someone who's fascinated by astrophysics bhavesh joshi asks why space smells like metal or gunpowder what does space smell like space is mostly empty is mostly vac- vacuum so i don't think it has any spa- any any smell okay. i believe what he's talking about is that when astronauts go into a space station or a sat or or a, or a spacecraft that is in orbit mm. there is a certain smell that they perceive okay so yes i have heard about this and i, I don't think there's any good explanation thus far of mm. why it smells the air smells a certain way inside mm. a spacecraft god it beautiful amir asks this is at kaule amir theoretically if time travel is possible what will be the potential counter effects on reality as we know will it create multiple timelines so say uh again this is that whole paradox theory which i'll let you only shed light on but say tomorrow i go back 50 years into the past and um, you know i meet my friend's grandmom uh, who is gorgeous uh, who's a gorgeous lady and i decide to stay back th- there in that timeline and i marry her and i have kids with her will my friend even exist in the morning exactly this is something called the grandfather paradox mm. so let's say you go back in time and you murder your own, own grandfather when will you exist anymore <laughs> that's the question right so time travel causes all these uh, problems in the causal structure of the of the universe which is possibly why it may not be possible to do it it may not be allowed by the laws of physics but we haven't progressed that far in our understanding mm. of the laws of physics to know whether it's possible or not mm. now will it create multiple timelines i believe there is a theory of quantum mechanics called the everettian theory the many worlds theory in which every decision that you make splits the universe off into different branches so every time you flip a coin If you have heads here, in a parallel universe, you got the other thing, hmm. that sort of thing. So you may have a multitude of parallel universes yeah. very close together in which you exist at the same time, but you are living different lives. Hmm. Um, you know, I think I'd seen this episode of Cosmos, which I'm sure you've watched as well. Cosmos, the show with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I haven't watched it. Oh, it's lovely. Like uh, you should like, like every every one should check it out. Again, um, it's all everything you've spoken about, even in today's episode. But explained through animation, through okay. <clears throat> through amazing, beautiful animation. Have you watched a show called Family Guy ever? It's an offensive cartoon. I have seen some of it. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. the same guy made Family Guy had a big role to play in Cosmos. So they combined, oh. you know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's knowledge as a physicist with this dude's uh, knowledge as a entertainer. Okay. So just gorgeous outcomes. Interesting. And they kind of celebrated science on that show. And I'm dead sure that many of the people who are on this podcast till this point are Cosmos uh, fan boys and fan girls. Uh, but either way, Cosmos spoke about a concept where um, they said that okay, mathematically there is a theory of infinite universes. Am I right? When I yes. Say okay. It's not in- entirely infinite. It's like ten raised to five hundred. Ah. Okay. That's string theory. That's a string theory landscape. Got it. So it's almost infinite. You could say. Okay. Then my question is null and void because I assume that there are infinite universes, and I remember having this conversation with someone who was. into uh, quantum physics who had said that that means that every thought of yours is actually a reality and it's happening in some universe yes it's so it's an almost infinite universe kind of uh, concept it's not entirely infinite but it's close to that so everything that can do, that you can think of that you can imagine it probably exists somewhere in some version of the, of the universe spider man with wings yeah right. possibly who knows <laughs> it is an actual spider man with wings in some universe somewhere there is a theory that anything that you can conceive of anything you can imagine exists somewhere in some universe somewhere or it becomes a universe because of your imagination even the act of thinking is a choice so every choice that you make splits the universe off into different branches according to this particular interpretation of quantum mechanics so if that interpretation is correct yes you know how if i move my hand yeah 
now i have moved my hand from this level to a higher level okay yes. that means the light that's bouncing off my hand has also moved as in my uh, this movement now has been registered in the universe's timeline forever it is yes does it go out in the universe does that light go out in the universe well this light is confined within our room it's not going out okay so say you are standing in an open field and you flash uh, you know you 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 keep a tv under you and you play a youtube video you play a beer vices video then that beer vices video goes out into the universe forever. it does yes um so in the same way do the thoughts that you have also go out in the universe because we say oh, think positive whatever you think will come back to you so this is a philosophical theory it's not a scientific theory okay so if there is a consciousness field out there then it's very possible mm. that your thoughts may reach out to other consciousnesses or they may be become part of the field mm. but it's not a scientific theory okay got it cool i but i i mean it's also one of those things which i believe exists because i, I mean okay i've done maybe 130 140 podcasts now all the and and you included in this list okay all the i i pers okay i personally perceive the concept of success as personal happiness success is subjective that's For your some, definition of success yeah that's my definition of yes. success that my definition of success is every single human being has his own version of success yeah. for someone it could be a stable family life for lots and lots of people it could be knowledge and curiosity for lots and lots of people it could be the obvious ones like materialistic yes. shit like money mm. whatever fame all the 130 140 podcasts that i've had or say 100 plus guests that i've had are all accomplishers they've done something either accomplished stuff in the material world or accomplished stuff in the spiritual world or accomplished stuff in the world of knowledge like yourself or a combination of these but the base of it is a certain degree of positivity and peace i've always seen this i don't think we've had one guest who looked at the person and said you're not happy on the inside or you're not sending out positivity into the world now if you're putting out positivity into your work in the world it comes back to you as the success that the world sees people look at your youtube channel with that jengis khan video which is yes. what how i found you i found your i was like yo who is this man who has this kind of knowledge you're putting out your own positivity about learning and knowledge into the world maybe it's manifesting itself as a youtube video and that youtube video is going out to all these seekers now that's the uh, kind of confined theory of put positivity out then positivity will come back it comes back to you yes but <clears throat> i feel that also happens on a life experience level that when you are thinking positive when you're not criticizing other people when you're just concerned with your own shit your own definition of happiness your own family you're given more of that stuff obviously there's a base of hard work because you're putting that hard work energy also into that soup that you're building so positivity attracts positivity yes. it attracts success yes well that is something that you see over and over again it's a pattern that you see in human existence isn't it mm. so clearly there is something to it but we don't have a scientific law for it but if there were to be a scientific law out of all the things you studied what is the closest representation of that thought would it be this whole thing about you and me are joined by the same consciousness so is that negative dude who's sitting somewhere in some corner of the country okay but because you and me are vibrating on a higher level of like knowledge frequency or positivity frequency and so there's more of a connection between us and there's less of a connection between that person and the general field of consciousness sends us more comforts in the form of money or fame or whatever we are seeking whatever we are seeking yes yeah, yeah. um but what is the scientific theory well the scientific theory that comes closest to this is quantum field theory everything is fields everything is interrelated okay. right particles are are basically localized manifestation of fields mm. and there are certain interactions between uh, certain kinds of particles and they don't interact with other particles there are stronger interactions between certain fields less interaction between other fields so that sort of thing is there in quantum field theory and i would say that's the closest to what we are describing over here okay. so if there is a field of consciousness and positivity then you may have similar interactions mm. in that matter mm. so if it is possible to create a mathematical theory of of positivity and consciousness then you could probably construct it along the lines of quantum field theory mm. and see how that goes it may throw up something very similar as a physicist do you believe in this that if you think more positive then the universe around you will give you more positivity i am a very it. strong believer in positivity mm. absolutely keeping your scientist aside <laughs> the scient i'm i'm sure you know everyone has different versions of their, themselves inside them i'm the youtuber when cameras on i'm the businessman in my room i'm the thinker alone i'm the meditator when i'm even more alone in the same way i'm sure there are different versions there's a historian there's a scientist 
if you keep the scientist aside and you just think of the thinker inside you you're able to pick up on people's energies absolutely okay immediately okay you can like even like the moment you meet them yeah you can and you're not someone who meditates much i have meditated in the past i have okay. used vipassana oh okay so it's not been part of my life for the past few years but i have done that i've done pranayam so i've been into that in the past the reason i ask you this is because does your study of quantum physics increase that ability of intuition according to you no theory is not practice quantum field theory quantum physics it's all theoretical the more you study it the more you solve problems you you get better at that and you may maybe get some insights but meditation is a practice it's not a theory and when you practice that then it's a whole different level of experience mm. so yeah it it gives me some intellectual insights into maybe the way things are but meditation gives you intellectual insights no the quantum field theory gives me intellectual insight it gives me gives me a different level of knowledge than right. most what most people would have so i can see more patterns more parallels in between science and and philosophy for example mm. but when you meditate it's a practice i mean you can you can describe meditation theoretically that if you you do certain processes and certain things will happen mm. but only when you do it yourself will you will you feel those sensations mm. and see those insights with your eyes closed and all that mm. so you have to actually practice it in in person uh, and only then can you get the insights yeah. oh. for example when buddha meditated he got nirvana and he he tried to preach that you know his his learnings so you can write a book about them and you can read them but unless you attain nirvana yourself you will not know mm. what it means right mm. that sort uh, of thing um you know how are you a good reader of people where has that come from is it's, it because of your world of science no it's not it's mm. something that's born within you okay got it it's something i discovered after the age of 20 that i can actually understand people i didn't know that until then mm. so i i I lived in a hostel when I was doing my MSc and that's where I got into into contact with lots of lots of different kinds of people mm. and that's where I realized that I can actually understand people mm. without verbal communication mm. so I think that's you pick up on body language cues or or maybe yeah. some other thing yeah that we, we may not perceive with your eyes or whatever but it is something that exists definitely it's pattern recognition so pattern recognition definitely yes uh, you know you all noah harari keeps coming up on this podcast because he's he's also like you you know ocean of knowledge now in one of his books i can't remember which one um he highlighted the fact that okay now if you take the concept of intuition and break it down from a scientific perspective the fuck is it like what is it it is basically i am with you right now when i'm looking into your eyes the corner of my eyes are also noticing your hands the corner of my eyes are also noticing your eyebrows even though i'm looking into your right eye okay now someone with a great intuition versus someone with a weak intuition what does that really mean the person with a great intuition has a higher processing power in the brain therefore that person is able to see the hands and the eyebrows and notice these mic when have you blinked when have you nodded your head the person with the higher processing power is able to retain that information put it on a sheet of paper within their own heads and then come up with results that oh okay this person is possibly thinking of this I personally feel that when you are studying science and quantum mechanics and all in that kind of detail, you're fo- focusing on improving that brain muscle of yours. Yes, yes. Therefore, absolutely. maybe your intuition is also building an interpersonal skill. That's an interesting theory, and it may be possible for sure. Mm. I'll tell you something about pattern recognition. Pattern recognition needs a lot of data processing, mm. so you cannot recognize patterns until you have absorbed a lot of data. Exactly. You know what is wisdom? Wisdom is nothing but pattern recognition. so you cannot be wise until you reach a certain age and you have processed a certain amount of data mm. only if you do so willingly mm. and then also you need to have the intelligence to recognize patterns that other people cannot see mm. and also you need to know what to do based on certain patterns yeah. what action to take yeah. that is essentially wisdom mm. and that's what all this machine learning and all that is you are automating wisdom yeah. you're crunching through vast reams of data and you're trying to see patterns and then you're deciding what to do with it Yeah. predictive 100%. analytics 100% age does bring its benefits yeah, it does yeah one of which is this but i i also mean i mean not everyone who's older should be you uh, will meet people who are really old who have no wisdom whatsoever yeah. that's also there so yeah. it's not entirely necessary for you to mm. be old and then you're wise yeah. it's not entirely it's, it doesn't always hold true in my experience the best advice i've got when it comes to an older person is when the older person is open Yes. In terms of not who doesn't shoot down your ideas, who doesn't shoot down your theories, but instead says that okay, I hear you, but how about this? You know, you look at this. Absolutely. So if you want any advice from an older person, it comes the best advice 
uh, comes from people like that who are open, who hear you, uh, who have that little child alive inside of them. Absolutely, well. oh, an open mind is very necessary. Yeah. Without that, nothing happens. You know, it doesn't work. Yeah. But we're doing astrophysics here. So, <laughs> Niranjan Kumar asks about parallel universes. Um, nowadays, scientists are claiming that there's people with a parallel copy existing in real life. I think what he means to say is, if there is Ranveer in this universe, in another universe, is another version of me doing other things, or is an evil version of me? Um, like, what, what, what is this theory? Are there other versions of me in other places? So it's the uh, many worlds theory. Uh, every action that you take, it's a choice. So maybe there are multiple choices that you had and you, and you picked one. Mm. So when you do that, the world branches off into two different forks. In one fork, you are here, you have cho taken one, one choice. In the other one, you have taken some other choice. So every time you make a choice or you think about something or, or you interact with the world in a certain way, the world branches off. Mm. So eventually, over the years, where two very different runways may, occur, may, mm. may emerge out of this. In who have taken universes. Yes, in two parallel universes. And who have uh, who have chosen uh, very different uh, paths of life? Mm. It is possible. Mm. So according to this theory, if this theory is correct, then it is going to be that way that mm. you may have a multitude of versions of yourself, mm. and you are living all the possible choices and outcomes that you may ever be able to take in your life. Another beautiful mind-bending hypothesis with respect to what you just said is, you know, sometimes what is your intuition? Your gut feeling is a voice inside you. Saying, yo, do this. Be with this person. Don't be with this person. Don't take up this business deal. Stay away from this person. There's a voice inside you. So if that I say it. that, sir, close your eyes and think of your name. It's coming out of a certain place. Now, is this voice the future version of you warning you or guiding you to the correct paths? <laughs> we will not know. <laughs> but yeah, who knows? Mm. It may be true. You know, so like like when I look back at my own life, career-wise, okay, I'm not talking about engineering college. I'm talking about after. I've cut off certain mentors from my life who were giving me wrong advice. But I realized that only after a certain point. They also give me some right advice, which is why they stayed mentors for a bit. Now, after a point, I realized, no, no, I think I've outgrown this person's wisdom pool. And I used to get voices in my head saying, no, no, what he's saying is wrong. Mm -hmm. Or don't, don't listen to this. Yes. Or no, you know, this may not be entirely correct. Now, when I'm thinking about my life right now and I'm going back to those conversations in my own mind, I think, thank God I didn't listen to that guy at that point because that was wrong advice. Thank God I did what my gut was saying. Could it be that this version of me who's thinking back and looking back is actually communicating somewhere with that version of me, which heard a voice saying, hey man, don't listen to this guy or get out of this room. So if there is some possibility of communication at some level with a parallel universe and a parallel version of yourself, then maybe that's the maybe. that's the voice. But if there are an infinite number of versions of you, then you may have an infinite number of voices in your head. So that also not that also doesn't make sense. It's right. Too, so maybe there's another Ranveer who did not take the choice, make the choice that you have made, mm. and who stayed with that mentor. Mm. So maybe that Ranveer, Ranveer has taken a completely different path in life. Mm. But are you able to communicate with that specific Ranveer or not? We don't know. I think the voice in our head is our own intuition. It, it's it's within our own consciousness in this this universe mm. itself. That is my feeling about it. And, and consciousness is something beyond time. Consciousness exists as much in 2025 as it does in the age of the dinosaurs. It's very possible, yes. We don't know what consciousness is. There is no scientific definition of consciousness. It's the biggest mystery in science. Mm. We know it exists. We are trying to understand what it is, but we don't have the fuzziest idea of even how to define it. Mm. So in science, when you create a theory, you have to define something. What is a proton? What's an electron? You define it first, and only then do you study it. Mm. But we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know how to define it. Mm. We don't know where it emerges from. We don't know if it is localized, if it is somewhere else. Yeah. So it's an entire field, but it is very strongly connected to quantum mechanics because the observer effect seems to, to need a consciousness for it to happen. That's mm -hmm. a possibility. Coming back to this theory of infinite Ranveers. Yeah. Now that Ranveer in that room who was talking to that mentor and feeling that, no, no, I shouldn't listen to this dude giving me wrong advice in life. He listened to some voice, which is called consciousness. Consciousness is infinite, but it's Ranveer's consciousness at some level. Therefore, there are infinite Ranveers, positive ones and negative ones. 
that Ranveer in that room who chose to listen to the positive Ranveers, who were telling him what to do in life, who go down the right paths, versus another human being. I'm not like I mean, this is just Ranveer's situation. What if there's a negative human being? Let's call him, um, you know, something from B, okay, Bunty, a negative guy. He chooses to listen to all the negative bunties in his own consciousness. Therefore, he ends up taking the wrong decisions. So, on an everyday level, do you think? And this is I'm asking the scientist as well as the thinker, the philosopher. Do you think that that's the logic of staying positive, thinking that no, jo like so? There's a Hindi muhavra that says jo tha, wo bhi acha tha, jo ho raha hai, wo bhi acha hai, aur jo hone wale hai, wo bhi acha hi hoga. So when you start perceiving life with that kind of a prism, those kind of rose tinted glasses, when you start seeing positivity where there is not, where you say all is well, where things when it's not really well, well, yeah, then <clears throat> do all the positive versions of you from other parallel universes give you the right thing because you're more in sync with all of them? Well, that's a theory. I don't know. <laughs> We cannot prove it or disprove it, right? But it is possible. Yes. Okay. But do you think of scenarios like this for yourself? Because after all, you gained all this quantum physics knowledge, all this knowledge about physics in general, about the universe in general. Plus, I know you're a thinker. It affects your thinking. The thing is, I think about all kinds of things, but I don't have any certainty because in science, what I have realized is that we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything for certain. So there are these different interpretations of quantum mechanics, but we don't know if each of these is right. Only one could be right, or maybe none of them is correct. Mm -hmm. So people who who know less, they are very certain about things. People who know beyond a certain level. They are very uncertain about things because we know that there is so much that is not known to us. Yeah. So it is difficult for you to make a value judgment and say that yeah, this is the right thing. So I don't know. My answer is I don't know. True knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. And then we have people with a very limited amount of good knowledge. They probably have good knowledge, but think that they know everything, so therefore have opinions on everything. Yes, very judgmental people, right? Yeah. Yeah. They say that great minds discuss ideas and narrow minds discuss other people. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. Anyway. Um, Okay, let's get back to that round of Twitter questions. Some Indian scientists like A. K. Mitra, Acharya, Agnivrat, Neshtik believe that a black hole doesn't exist. Why do they say so? This question is from Devang Sharma. So the thing is this: that um, there are certain theories which say that there there could be objects like magnetic stars and all that, which are also very compact objects, which are also dark, and therefore they could look the same as a black hole. So, if you have an object like a magnetic comp compact object and a black hole sitting side by side, you will not be able to tell which is which because mm -hmm. they have very similar properties. Now, general relativity tells us that black holes do exist; they should exist. But there are other theories which say that other kinds of objects could also exist. So, these are valid scientific theories. These are not these are not nonsense. But I would, my belief and my certainty is that black holes do exist. And the world is riddled with them, because we have seen signs of black holes. We know that there is a big black hole at the center of our galaxy. We have recently taken a snapshot of a different black hole in an, in another galaxy. It was the Event Horizon Telescope. So there is a significant amount of incontrovertible proof that black holes do exist. That they, they are out there. But other kinds of objects, more exotic objects, could also exist. So I am open to that. But I would not agree that black holes are are not true. They they are fiction. That's not correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, maybe they call it something else, but it is a sub. It is an object with a lot of gravity. Yes. Yes. Very it, compact. So it's very gravitationally strong. So you know, theoretically, how we have those images of the Milky Way. Like I'm mm -hmm. sure those aren't real image. Like there's no device to take a real image, like a photograph of the Milky Way. No. No. We don't. We cannot do that. But when we talk about the Milky Way, how it's that circular shape. Yes, and spiral shape. Yeah, yeah, it's spiraling around something. Yes, uh, which is supposed to be that black hole. Yes, but when you said exotic object, what did you mean? Like, what else can be there? So there are other theories in which you have very compact gravitationally bound objects which have a very high uh, amount of magnetism. Okay, because they have a lot of charge in there, but they are they, they their radius is greater than what would be the event horizon of that mm. that object. Mm. Therefore, they are not technically black holes, but they are very similar, very similar to black holes, and they are very dark. So there are many such theories out there. You can construct a theory basically using the the laws of physics, which comes up with all kinds of different uh, phenomena, mm. and these could exist somewhere or the other. For example, in the theory theory of electromagnetism, there is something called a magnetic monopole. So Maxwell's equations do tell us that magnetic monopoles should exist. So 
if you take a magnet, it has a north pole and a south pole. You cut it in half, both the magnets will have north pole and south pole, right? Oh. They always they always have two poles. Mm. But according to the theory of electromagnetism, according to Maxwell's equations, there could even exist monopoles, just a north pole or just a south pole. We have never been able to see one in real life, but theoretically it's possible. Mm. So there are many such th- such outcomes of the laws of physics that we have never been able to observe, but may be out there. Mm. Okay. Adarsh Mishra asks, do you think that ancient Indian space science made any sense? Could it be true? Uh, and this is also me speaking to the historian inside you. As this mentioned about the distance from Earth to Moon in the Hanuman Chalisa by Tulsidas. I don't know what he means by that. Uh, but the first part of the question is interesting. Do you think ancient Indian space science made any sense? Like, Could it have existed? Um, and the reason... I want to ask that is because this is something we just spoke about with respect to Graham Hancock. You're talking about Graham Hancock. Yes. He keeps talking about civilizations that have existed for years but are not documented. Uh, and that's where this theory of did the Mahabharata or Ramayana actually happen that could have been very, very advanced civilizations where for some reason the science of them died out or the evolution of them died out. And then we had to restart from scratch. And our modern day human beings looking back at Harappa and Mohanjo-daro and saying that, oh, that's the first civilization when there could have been other civilizations. Like, I want to echo one last thing that Graham Hancock says, that when we look at ancient Egypt, which is 2,500, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, they themselves considered themselves a modern civilization when in truth there was probably another civilization which was, which happened way back, which was scientifically more advanced. Our gauge of studying scientific advancement is saying that, oh, you know, but if there was another civilization 50,000 years back, why can't we find their plastic or remnants from that civilization that exists today? But what if they didn't look at plastic as an advanced form of science and they could have looked at something biodegradable as an advanced form of science, which actually degraded. That's why there are no remnants left. So it is a possibility. See, what what we look for is ruins, ancient ruins. And if you find something, we make a certain assumption or deduction based on that. And when you don't find ruins be beyond a certain time period, you said there was nothing before that. Now, if you look at the geological history of the of the world, every 10, 20, 50 million or 100 million, million years, every time this passes, the entire geology changes of the planet. So if something had existed there, it would be completely obliterated, right? So if an advanced civilization did exist on this planet, let's say 200 million years ago, way more advanced than us, and then something happened, then over the over the next 200 million years, all traces of the civilization would have been wiped out because of the techno- tectonic activity and geological activity mm. of our planet. And therefore, we may never be able to see its existence or find any traces of that. Mm. But it doesn't mean it never existed. So the possibility is there. You have to keep an open mind. But you have to look for clues. And when, you look, when you're talking about such ancient civilizations, you will never find clues. Mm. But people who say that this thing could never have existed, they are people with closed minds who are not open to the possibilities possibilities that science itself gives us. Mm. Right. Now, when you talk about Egypt, there could have been their civilization before Egypt, more advanced. It is entirely possible. I'm open to that. If I find evidence of that, I'll say it it was definitely there. If I don't find evidence of that, I'll say that it may have been there, but we don't have evidence. Mm. But you can't say it was never there. Mm. The possibility is not there. You cannot say that. So some some people are like that, dogmatic historians who say that there was nothing before so-and-so thing. That's not true. Mm. Uh, but about his question about Mahabharata and Ramayana, that right, ancient right. sciences. So there are lots of interesting references in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana about various weapons, very energetic, very powerful weapons. There are mentions of flying machines, vimanas and all that. Now we have no evidence of that. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. <laughs> right. So I am entirely open to the possibility that such things existed. I would want proof of that. Then I will say it did exist. Right now I'll say it may have existed. Mm. But I am not of the opinion that it would. It, it's impossible. I'm not of that opinion. Lovely. It's possible. Love that answer, sir. And this is why I wish to create historical content with you. By historical content, I don't mean content that becomes historical. I mean content about history. But I believe that the content we're creating has potential to become historical. Once again, I want to end this podcast by bowing down to your knowledge. Like you've spent so much time researching and reading. I believe that this is only 1% of the knowledge you have. And I hope that people spread the word about this podcast. So when it comes to the study of physics, 
is there any parting note that you wish to give the listeners or viewers who are more interested about going deeper into this world like any books any references what is the path to begin well the books that i know of are all technical books uh, <laughs> i don't really i haven't really read any uh, popular books about physics my understanding is that we all intuitively understand science mm. okay mm. we don't know that our education system makes us fear science makes us fear mathematics but mathematics and science are actually very intuitive subjects for example if i have a, have a ball if i go to the park and i have a ball with me i go to the park with my, with my dog i throw the ball in the air my dog doesn't know the laws of newtonian mechanics he doesn't know that the ball will trace a parabolic path and come down at a particular location but he's able to get there he's able to catch the ball right so it's not like he understands physics but he has an intuitive understanding of it of the mechanics of the world so we all of us have an intuitive understanding of physics especially indians we have a genetic understanding because we have india is the birthplace of science and mathematics we have always been good at it we have to rediscover that passion it is there in our blood we over the past 100 or 200 or 1000 years it's been it's been kind of stamped out for some time temporarily but we have it in us mm. so i think we should all take an interest in science and try to understand and learn it gorgeous ah you know so much more to create with you uh looking forward to the next episode i'll be i'm see i'm like losing my words right now but i'll be linking all of your handles down below um if people want to find more of the work that you do where should they look for you just google my name okay twitter would be twitter as well yeah okay lovely i i still feel we're just at the brink of everything that you're going to create for the world of content so looking forward to it happy to be a part of this podcast with you sir happy to create this podcast and i personally feel that again i'm speaking as the student inside me that if you are to go deeper into the world of physics it comes from a friend a brother a sister teaching you and i feel that that's what we've done possibly for seekers out there so glad to created this with you thank you thank you for having me excited as shit for the history podcast that we're going to do now so uh, let's move into that absolutely <laughs>